Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to Product School's webinar on strategy and tactics in product management. My name is Ankur, and I've been an engineer, banker, and an entrepreneur before I was ever, ever a product manager. Uh, my last experience at Amazon as, was essentially as a senior product manager technical. Um, now, before we begin to dive into strategy and tactics, uh, we need to understand that strategies and tactics are just a means to an end. The end is usually a goal, a milestone, or even a mission. During this presentation, I will dive back examples of strategies and tactics with real world companies and their missions. Uh, let's jump straight into it. It begins with mission. All companies at some point were just an intent to do something. Uh, teams that understand the mission of a product or a company are greatly at an advantage because they can set goals, um, smaller goals even, that, build them, build, that bring them closer to their overall mission. Now, if you consider this pyramid here, um, if the mission is the why we do what we do or why we exist, um, then the goal is the what, as in what do we want to achieve? And the strategy is the how. Why do, oh, sorry, how do we, how do we want to get there? Uh, tactics are a way to execute a strategy, and operations are the processes of implementing tactics. Uh, product managers operate at pretty much every level of this pyramid, although they tend to focus more on goals, strategies, and tactics. Uh, coming back to the mission, uh, here, are, here are missions from some of the largest companies in the world. If you think about the products and services that they offer, you will find that they align very well with their overall mission. Uh, for example, Airbnb is all about belonging anywhere. Uh, this includes the obvious staying in the home like setting wherever you go, but it also includes the less obvious experiencing local cultures and activities. Yeah. Um, so having Airbnb experiences as part of the overall product portfolio makes absolute sense. Uh, here's another example. Meta is all about bringing communities together. You know, people you know, people with common interests, and maybe setups that you love or like. Um, a straightforward strategy for them to increase revenue is just to get more people on their products. But to do this, they acquired Instagram and WhatsApp, and they consistently invest heavily in Facebook as well as Messenger. Uh, but they make money through ads. When Apple launched enhanced privacy settings, uh, Facebook lost over a billion dollars worth of revenue, and they couldn't do anything about it. They need to be able to set the rules of the platform on which they operate. And they can do this with Metaverse, which incidentally is also a way to allow people to virtually connect with each other. Uh, that might explain why they're so invested in making the Metaverse a huge success. Without their own platform, they're at the mercy of other platforms that they operate on. Um, I mean, things like Android, iOS, we've seen iOS, Windows, as well as Mac. Do right? you have browser restrictions coming in? Uh, Metal will suffer a little bit more. Now that we have some degree of understanding of how missions work and how they drive decisions for products as well as companies, let's add another video, the product lifecycle journey. On this graph here, the y-axis represents the product's growth, while the x-axis represents the passage of time. Uh, take a second to think about where some of your favorite products are in their life cycle. I'll take an example of one of my favorite products. So um, we call it Netflix. Uh, this is uh, the quarterly revenue mapped over the last 13 years for Netflix. It's hard to say exactly where it is in its life cycle, but I think it's easy to see that the growth in the quarterly revenue is declining. You know, as, as a means to counter this, they increase subscription costs, which is effective in the short term to boost growth for a couple of months, but it does not sustain long-term growth. Um, there have been localized attempts by Netflix to clamp down on account sharing across area codes. Uh, me and my sister live in different countries. Uh, I, I personally face where she couldn't access the Netflix account. I actually have an account for her within my subscription, but she was unable to use it. 
Uh, and the idea behind this was that they expect to they expect that people because they can't access it will essentially end up buying their own subscriptions and you know gain more paying customers. Um, I think the strategy is a hit on this. Uh, it really depends on where they implement it, but in places it might have done more harm than good. Um, so there are other ways to increase their growth on this graph here. So what other ways can they uh, make more money? And the answer is ads on Netflix. Well, that sounds like a nightmare for people that subscribe, but it might be just what the company needs to sustain growth a little longer. Uh, in this particular case, they plan on doing this by introducing an ad-supported subscription tier. Basically, a cheaper version of Netflix subscriptions where you might see a few ads. Um, in this example, the goal for the company is to keep 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 the revenue growing, and the strategy is to implement advertising in the product. Excuse me. There's also a customer strategy in here somewhere. And uh, the customer strategy is that we might be able to address a new customer segment that isn't on Netflix yet. Somebody who might be willing to pay a little bit less uh, with ads. Uh, as opposed to the only, you know, two options that we have today, pay full price for Netflix or don't be on Netflix. Uh, interestingly, this brings me to my next point. Strategy isn't just for products. It is also for customers, competitors, sales, marketing, technology, people, what have you. Product managers need to consider these facets depending on the context of the product or the industry that they're in. Uh, you also notice that depending on where the product is in its life cycle, product managers need to apply different types of strategies. In fact, in some cases, product managers may have to apply a combination of two or more strategies because there is no accurate way to tell where a product is exactly in its life cycle. Uh, in the Netflix example, I would say um, the product was essentially between growth and maturity, approaching mid-maturity, but it's hard to tell exactly. Right? So each strategy listed uh, in the slide uh, can have multiple tactics, can have multiple approaches, and you might be compelled to put a combination of these together to work effectively. Uh, so let's dive into some examples here. I'm going to cover some of these uh, strategies and discuss the tactics that lie within them. So the first strategy is a, pro uh, is a excuse me, a product launch uh, strategy, and here's some tactics within within the product launch strategy. The first one is niche to broad. Uh, you've seen this very popularly with Facebook. They focused on uh, the academia of Harvard, uh, then moved on to different countries across, sorry, different colleges or universities across the country, and then eventually segmented out to different continents. Today, they cater to everybody. There is no restriction. But this approach of Niche to broad creates a, a niche to broad created a demand for it. Uh, it created an acceptance that hey, people that are um, really smart, people that understand socials, and people that are in universities, the cool hep kids, they're using the product. I don't know if anybody uses cool or hep anymore, but I just did. Uh, anyway, so the the idea is that hey, there's a there's a segment that has already shown acceptance and adoption of this product. Uh, it's likely, uh, if we can package it differently, it's likely that this, another segment of the market will be able to adopt it, just following the first. Uh, Tesla was actually launched as a sports uh, car initially, and Fitbit was launched, launched for um, athletes and fitness enthusiasts. The second one is limited edition things, um, or um, as I like to call it, the luxury segment uh, syndrome. It's, it's, it's because it's actually used primarily in the luxury segment to jack up margins and prices. Ferrari, Mont Blanc, Air Jordans, all known to have limited edition products and all known to get sold like hot cakes despite their excessively high prices. Um, the third one's uh, limit the supply of the product. This is very similar to the limited edition tactic, but they will make the supply available after the demand builds up. So Hershey's released a three and a half pound version of Reese's Candy for Thanksgiving specifically. 3,000 units also got in two hours and they released the next batch. Uh, this ensured that they were left with leftovers uh, in case there was no demand. Um, I, I believe that limiting the supply actually may have increased the demand 
because of the urgency of Thanksgiving coming up in the next week or so. Um, finally, we have the early bird incentives. Now, every concert, stand-up comedy show, conference, or sports event that you've ever attended would likely have had this incentive. Uh, typically, you used to drive up sales ahead of events or product launches to ensure enough runway to deliver the product. Um, you know, I think a similar concept that we have is crowdfunding. It's not exactly the same thing, but you can essentially subscribe to a service or a product at a lower price, and it gives the founders or the organizers enough of a runway to deliver their, on their promises. Uh, the second step uh, in the product life cycle uh, focuses on scaling for the product. Um, and it, it becomes scaling rapidly across users, transactions, and or sales. Um, anything that can generate long-term revenue or result in long-term sales. Uh, the first one in this case, uh, parallelizing development and monoliths to microservices, it's, it's a little bit more technical. Uh, you, Some of you may not understand what this is, but essentially what it says is that when you're creating a product or developing a product, um, design it as a collection of small independent components instead of one large monolithic system. Um, this helps reduce bottlenecks, enable parallel development because you've got separate sections coded and separate applications. It makes issue identification easier, identifies bottlenecks more easily because one system is broken as opposed to the whole engine. And it also encourages integrations because uh, all of these small systems are already integrating with each other. Uh, you can simply use, build on that philosophy and integrate with third party applications. All of these things that I've described are useful for scaling a product. Uh, the second option that we have is uh, economies of scale, and it allows market leaders to lead in two things, selection and price. Uh, both Amazon and Walmart are known to be able to offer the lowest rate to customers in some specific areas, and they own a significant portion of the market in their respective fields. Uh, then we have cross-platform operability which refers to the availability of a product on multiple platforms. The most common everyday apps like Word, PowerPoint, Calendar, are almost seamlessly integrated with hundreds of other apps and services. That's why it's an easy choice for people like me, uh, because I don't have to worry about things like Calendly being compatible with my Outlook Calendar. Just kidding, I use Google. Um, and then we have product customers. Once the product goes through its entire life cycle, you know, people begin, companies, products, they begin to lose users and customers. Uh, this is especially true for non-critical products, things like Facebook, Netflix, PlayStation. Uh, I think Facebook has already seen it. There's news articles all over, all over uh, saying that Gen Z and millennials don't use Facebook anymore. Well, they um, Anyway, but in order to keep users engaged and tied to the platform, Product managers use sustenance tactics. It's hard, but it can be effective. Well, the came for, stayed for is a really bad heading, but it describes the phenomenon well. Uh, apps like Pinterest, Spotify, and Facebook increase user retention by tying them to the platform with data. Uh, you know, the, your friends, the groups that you follow, the pictures that you posted, the apps that you've installed, your specifically curated feed. Um, you know, for Spotify, it's playlists, uh, artists that you follow, you know, recommendation engine. It's personalization. You stay for personalization and your data. Uh, the second one is uh, building a new business line. Amazon began as a bookstore, uh, expanded to selling everything under the sun, then expanded to providing cloud services to AWS. Along the way, they introduced Fire Stick TV, movie production studios, household devices, phones, games, you name it. One of these new business lines now brings in an overwhelming majority of Amazon's revenue. Uh, it's eight of us, just in case you're wondering. Uh, that's one way to discover how to keep your growth persistent. Um, and then we have the final additional tiers sort of example. And I think we saw, we saw part of it earlier with Netflix's ad deal. Um, Spotify's family tier is another way to maximize revenue from the subserved and the underserved customer segments, but it's largely um, targeting a broader segment of the market. 
because your primary segment is no longer yielding benefits. Uh, oh, and the last one we have is the product green one, or, excuse me, product green mention tactics. Um, product green mention isn't just used when products hit maturity. They can also be used when the growth is slow or products are failing. Let's take a look at uh, some of these tactics here. The first one is a broader value chain tactic. You know, Netflix went from renting DVDs to owning their own production house. Um, Steam went from producing single game titles to being the most used gaming platform on earth. Google and iOS went from stock phone software to building a creator economy on phone apps now called the Play Store. Um, all of them discovered a broader opportunity within their industry and they raced to capture it. Uh, the narrow depth refers to products that have achieved such an immense expertise or convenience in their field that they become synonymous with the service that they provide. As it the exact opposite of going broad. Uh, Google, Xerox, they're more common examples of uh, the narrow depth tactic, uh, but you know what? There are lasagna, excuse me, lasagna pasta sheet millionaires in this world as well. Um, they specialize in creating one ingredient of a dish that can be made at home. And that's about as narrow as it gets. Um, and, and, and these products are success too. Nuts and bolts that fit a particular type of vacuum cleaner. There's no replacement, right? That, that does the job. Um, and the third one we have is, well, it's a catch all. Uh, I've used Meta and Nokia here with Meta trying to capture the, uh, sorry, the Metaverse platform. Uh, one might say that they are pursuing a broader value chain tactic, but it's also attempting to reinvent online social interactions. So there's definitely a reinvention component there. I think Nokia is more of an example of a company that did not reinvent on time. Um, they got founded by iOS and, and Android. All right, so we've covered, we've covered some product strategies. Uh, you can see we've covered launch, scale, sustain, and reinvent. Uh, now let's talk about some customer strategies. Uh, these are also very critical because uh, more often than not, your products have customers. Um, interestingly, there's a huge overlap between the strategies and tactics that I've presented. Uh, just the lens will change a little bit. So let's, let's jump right in. Um, the first segment that we're going to talk about is early stage products again. Um, they need high conversions. They're really very, very focused on growth. Uh, and we have three broad tactics for this segment. First is reduce sign up friction. I've used Google, Facebook, and LinkedIn because you can use these apps to sign into any app these days. If an app forces you to send an email and a password and then they'll give you an email confirmation link, Excuse me. they're likely going to lose you in the sign-up process. So sign-up friction reduction, great tactic to increase adoption. Second one, the shorten viral loops. Um, this is a common example. I think Amazon's one-click buy or sharing TikTok reels with people who can see them without signing up for TikTok. Uh, both these things reduce time and effort needed for people to do what they need to do. Uh, by shortening the viral, viral loop, you are reducing the time spent on the heavy lifting, creating value for people exactly where they need it. It keeps people on the platform, makes them want to use the platform more. I am a TikTok user that started using it without an account, eventually I signed up with one. Um, and the third one is third-party integration. Um, this is a huge reason for the success of both Slack and Calendly. Um, as Almost every single user that uses Slack and Calendly is experiencing using plugins or integrating with their own calendars. And these users know that these apps will just work with their current setup easily. They don't have to put in a lot of work. The second stage in the product's growth results in the need for customer growth. So a product in the growth stage of a life cycle depends directly on the growth of its user base. Uh, with that said, here are some ways PMs can do exactly that. Um, the first one is important, importing network effects. Airbnb and LinkedIn used this method to scale it in their early years. Um, Airbnb displayed Craigslist listings on its website when it did not have enough volume of properties on its own website. 
Um, and then, you know, that led to more options for Airbnb users, which resulted in an increase in the number of people joining the website. Uh, LinkedIn asked its current users to import their contact list and had tools built to make this extremely easy for them. Um, everybody sooner or later was guilty of sending a LinkedIn invite saying, hey, come join my professional LinkedIn, uh, professional network on LinkedIn. And they have sent bulk emails to their contact lists. Um, and the, the next one I want to talk about is automation. Uh, automation is not just used in these uh, companies. In fact, these companies produce some degree of automation for almost every other company. Um, but when I talk about automation, it can refer to customer conversion funnel automation, automation of language translation, automation of development, uh, or anything really. Um, almost every single product will have its own automation opportunities and projects. Uh, and it's a great way to support the growing customer base. Uh, finally, we have the marketing strategy. That's right. I said strategy as a tactic. Uh, it's an effective marketing strategy can be a, a really great growth tactic. Uh, real life examples of this include products that show up on Shark Tank or Dragon's Den and end up growing like three or 10 X overnight. Um, so she, I just want to call out here, right? Uh, strategies and tactics, they depend on the context. So I'll cover this a little bit more specifically towards the end of the presentation, but a strategy can be a tactic, a tactic can be a strategy. Um, don't get caught up in the weeds. Uh, third, we have customer engagement. This is typically for companies that are in their maturity stage. Um, customer engagement tactics help minimize churn for these companies and products as a large area of focus for mutual products. Uh, it is definitely great to have customer engagement at every stage of product lifecycle. PMs can drive customer engagement through gamification. Um, a good example includes uh, things like adding points, premium services, arts or assets uh, on your account. Uh, medals, achievements, you know, sharing with your friends. You get the idea. Starbucks sits on hundreds of millions of advanced dollars uh, that their customers spend on them to buy points for their loyalty or to, to buy money on their app. Um, by having this money in advance of the actual spend, they generate well, millions of dollars worth of interest. Um, the second one is activating the reward center. Well, the dopamine hit that we're all guilty of chasing. You know, you want the next photo, you want the next reel, you want to read that next post, or you just want to scroll indefinitely. Um, the third one is the infinite, infinite information uh, tactic, which is actually a variant of the reward center tactic applied to text, articles, news. In fact, it is so popular that news apps use similar models to see an increase in their daily news consumption, effectively making news addictive. That is the question. Um, and finally, we have maximize dependency on product. Um, things like Google Translate and Maps, they just, there's, there's no competition with that. I know if I need a translation service, I'm still going to need to translate. Uh, vendors of uh, Three-tier approach for years has allowed Microsoft to break into millions of homes, small and medium businesses with the operating system as well as the office. The last one is during the decline. Customer retention is a key metric that everybody is tracking. It is, um, I, I think it's a, it's a key metric that people should be focusing on even in the early stages. But you will certainly see founders and product managers focus on this towards the end of the journey, um, just because that's the only way to keep the company alive or the product alive. Um, there's three key ways of doing this, but I think ownership of digital assets and lifetime data are fairly similar. Um, they're, they're fairly similar in that they're unique to every single user and they hold some key value for them. Uh, digital assets usually refers to things like uh, websites or uh, files or patents that may provide monetary benefit as well. So Shopify is, is a very unique case. Things have crypto wallets and you tend to lose your accounts, but you'll never close it as long as you have money in there, right? 
Uh, lifetime data is just your friends and photos, you know, stuff that you posted for years and years and years. Uh, you might not be an active user, but I see very few few people going there and saying, "Let's delete my account." It definitely has a little bit uh, of a click there. Um, the second one is maximizing dependency. Uh, the, we've seen this before. I've right? seen the exact same examples, but dependency is also a product lens and it's also a customer lens. It drives both retention as well as engagement. Um, so it's easy to notice uh, how the two might be related, right? The retention and the engagement. So this is one of those examples which tend to be really high impact, um, that tend to affect more than one strategy at a time. So you want to look out for more of these as you move forward. Um, now this covers some real life examples of actions, product teams, and companies take to achieve specific outcomes. One thing that is common in all of them is that they are all rooted in strategy. All right, so we're almost at the end. Uh, let me take a few minutes to call out some important aspects of what we've covered. Uh, depending on who you're speaking to and the goals that they want to achieve, the definition of a strategy or a tactic may change. A scaling tactic like um, using microservices instead of monoliths from a product perspective might be a microservices strategy from a technology perspective, which may consist of several tactics to implement microservices. Now, how do you implement it? Um, so the change in perspective changes exactly what we're talking about. It's also important to note that a strategy can be a part of a tactic, and a strategy can be a part of another strategy. So again, because this is fluid, uh, don't get caught up in creating these distinctions. Uh, when you have the North Star in front of you, when you have the goal in front of you, it's easy to tell the difference between what a strategy is and what tactic is. Uh, the second call or the second outcome is what works for one product does not always work for another product. Outside the example of TikTok and Instagram, uh, this is there's one minor difference between these two applications. Excuse me. <laughs> I apologize. Instagram is meant for people to connect with friends, family, interests, you know, uh, things that you're already sort of uh, related to or have a relationship with. While TikTok is meant for people to get popular by posting TikToks or, you know, it's meant for people to discover popular content. Unfortunately for Instagram, science shows that discovering new content is more rewarding to people than seeing the updates of friends and family. Um, with such a minor difference, Instagram's strategic approach to try and become a content discovery platform completely backfired when influencers threatened to buy out the platform during loss of their following. I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but essentially Instagram has a search function, which is where you get to discover, and then they have a home function, which is curated for you. TikTok also has something similar. They have a for you and discovery section, but the the difference is that TikTok lands on discovery, whereas Instagram lands on your curated feed, you know, of your friends and family. They try to switch that to make it a more of a discovery platform, and that's essentially what took a hit. Um, there's, I think, there's articles on this if you just Google it. Uh, it's, it's really interesting phenomenon. Um, the, and the last outcome that I'd like to talk about is as a product manager you will have constraints on what all you can pursue. You may have 10 great options, but you will need to choose based on your time and your resource constraints. Prioritize those strategies and initiatives that deliver high impact or a multiplier impact or magnifying impact. A good one is increasing dependency, right? It, it does have an impact on the company's business, on the customer's business, I apologize, the customer's experience. Um, you know, what have you. So this is important. This is the heavy lifting of a product manager, thinking about what are our different options, what can we combine, what should we not do, what should we do, um, and coming up with a lean, high-impact uh, you know, roadmap. That's what's important. Well, thank you so much for attending the webinar this afternoon. Um, you know, I really appreciate your attention. Uh, if you would like to see more content from me, Please connect with me on LinkedIn or follow me there. Uh, have a great rest of your day, everybody, and thanks again.